Hello everyone, welcome to yet another body webinar. Today we are going to talk about one of the most important things when it comes to the web performance. And we're going to talk about why this website performance matters so much and how we can improve it. I have Henri with me. Henri, say a few words about yourself. Hello, everyone. Hello. I'm so glad to be here. Um, I don't know. How do I start about myself? You know, because I could spend the entire webinar talking about myself. I'll try not to, but um, let me see. Uh, so I'm a developer in the greatest city on the planet, which is Toronto, Canada, in case you didn't know. Not Toronto, Kansas, because there is a Toronto, Kansas. Um, but uh, yes, uh, we're here to talk about um, web performance, which happens to be something that I love chit-chatting about. Um, and I love it so much that I started to work at a web performance company. Um, so uh, for anyone that's not heard of web page test, we're going to talk about it today. But I am on the web page test team uh, by Catchpoint. Uh, it's a fantastic uh, web performance monitoring tool um, or assessment tool. We're going to talk about it today. And uh, yeah, that's about it. I mean, um, I'm happy to be here. I like to run. Uh, oh, and I collect, uh, I collect uh, toy cars. I don't know if you can see that. I don't know. Yes, yes. <laughs> There we nice. go. Yes, and uh, my name is Maciek Pamoski. I work here at Buddy as a WordPress ambassador. And apart from this, I'm your regular webinar host. And um, okay, so before uh, before we'll start, let's um, let's do a quick sum up of what we'll talk today. So first of mm -hmm. all, we will talk about what is web performance. Mm -hmm. We will then f uh, discuss a bit how we can measure it because uh, there are many tools. Really, Lighthouse is not the only way we can do it. Mm -hmm. We'll talk what is core web vitals and what we can do to fix this, uh, this performance on our website because there are some tricks that are quite easy and there are some tricks that really involve um, kind of a redesign of your application because you just did it wrong from the beginning and suddenly this happens. Um, also, uh, if you like uh, our webinars, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. You will have a chance to uh, get all the latest info about uh, upcoming webinars and uh, join us also on our discord channel because we will have a chance to discuss web performance even after this webinar okay so uh with this out of oh and one more thing if you are on youtube remember we started a poll right here uh we will we, we are asking you what is your favorite image format when it comes to, to the web. So, uh, Amri, what is your favorite image format? Uh, man, oh, man. That's a fantastic question and, you know, potentially a political one. Uh, so, <laughs> I don't know. I may have to be careful how I answer this one. Um, I mean, my favorite one is certainly going to be modern, you know. Um, so, we can suddenly disqualify a lot of image formats at that point. Um, I don't know. You know, I, I think there's a lot to discuss there. You know, uh, I can give you a friendly answer. Uh, I can give you one that I absolutely think suits my needs best. Uh, Probably the similar to Moala. WebP is the best. You know what? <laughs> it, it certainly does have... Uh, oh, here we go. Uh, it certainly does have uh, qualities that we need right now. And I think uh, we'll be able to talk about that at some point today, I hope. Uh, I'm sure I, we will. Uh, but, uh, you know, WebP is one that suits the needs of the web. Uh, and uh, this is something I like to sort of joke around with sometimes. And I've given talks about this. You can't spell web performance without WebP. That's uh, true. So it's, uh, you know, I I'll leave it at that. But I, I think there are a lot of things to consider uh, and all things considered in a kind of a global scope of what we want out of uh, the web, uh, which is compatibility, which is um, uh, fast loading um, and, you know, 
and some of the sort of details that we like out of uh, web formats. Yes, WebP is one that you absolutely have to consider. You know, um, you're always going to have the you know the edge cases. You know, like hey, you know, I want 12 bit, I want 10 bit, I want this and that. And yes, there's some formats that might be a little bit better in terms of image quality, uh, but we are looking at like the bigger picture, pardon the pun, yeah. uh, which is yeah. again the co compatibility, the opportunity uh, to, to have it load on on every browser and stuff like that. So um, you have to consider WebP as one of the potential favorites. Yeah, I mean, uh, if if I would have to vote, I would also select WebP mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, during when, when you are res responding to the question about WebP, you also responded, by the way, a bit to a question that I wanted to ask you right now about what is web performance. And uh, you already started talking that uh, it's uh, about the speed, but uh, performance is not only speed. Is there are much many there, there are many aspects to to cover under Absolutely. this Absolutely. Um, I mean. Um... And it's funny you should say the cover because uh, I'd say the umbrella is ultimately user experience. Um, I remember when I was sort of discovering web performance, and you know, uh, you know, we like numbers, right? We like to know that you know something moves from this point to that point in this much time. You know, there's a reason why uh, the hundred meter race is the most you know, sought after and watched race mm -hmm. at the Olympics, you know, because people love speed. They love to know that, you know, someone can run, you know, 100 meters in 9.19 yeah. seconds or whatever it is. But when it comes to the web, um, certainly um, speed will always have a play into it. You know, um, we know what slow is. That's without a doubt. Um, but we also know what a good user experience is. And that being said, I think web performance is kind of like an inexact science. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it's a mixture of user experience. It's going to be a mixture of, of speed and performance. Um, and ultimately, you're trying to measure something that is potentially intangible, like someone's mood. You know, um, yeah. I know when I don't have a good experience at a site because certain things aren't loading fast enough or properly or they're jumping around a page. That is hard to measure. We're doing our best. In, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, there's some very smart engineers out there who have been, you know, banging away trying to get that done in terms of like, what does it look like? How do you quantify a bad experience? Um, but we certainly know how to quantify a slow experience, you know, because we can just measure that. Uh, so web performance ultimately is a mixture of user experience. It's a mixture of speed, which is really under user experience umbrella. Um, and it, it's one that we try to um, have some control over. Um, we try to create some best practices in trying to create this experience that's not going to you know, ruin our mood uh, and, and want to make us throw the phone away. Um, and, and we try to kind of like make sure that it's as smooth as possible, you know. And there are so many reasons why we've come to this point. You know, I just mentioned um, having to throw the phone away. Well, that's because we are experiencing the web now, uh, and I won't say exclusively, but predominantly on hand, handheld devices. You know, um, I believe it was 2016, in fall of 2016, you know, plus or minus a few months. Mm -hmm. um, generally, it was accepted that um, the data came out that finally the web was being experienced more on the, the handheld device, the phone, than the desktop. That's when mm -hmm. that point they kind of crossed the inflection point, as they might say, and we've never turned back. Like, we're never going to go back to desktops being the predominant uh, form factor for the web. It's always going to be the handheld device at this point. Uh, and in fact, you know, I'm sure you may have seen this, but, you know, there are some um, uh, uh, territories uh, where the web is being experienced 
on the handheld first. There's some people, there's a good chance in their entire lives, they may not touch a desktop that much. You know, there's a very good chance of that happening. So, yeah, there um, are even many countries like this. Uh, I, I remember at some point, uh, I think even China is one of one 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 of such countries uh, because of, of of many reasons. But uh, yeah, and this changes the the experience totally mm -hmm. because uh, mm -hmm. at some point we were used to that we are using our our desktop, our laptop as uh, uh, the for, main. Sort for, of... for, 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 for yeah, exactly. And at some point, everything changed. Yeah. And I remember that for at, at some when when I worked uh, at, at the company when we are taking care of content websites, mm -hmm. we saw this moment when it, this, the, the thing that you said, when it switched from, from desktop into, into mobile. At first it was just, uh, I remember it was mostly during holidays mm -hmm. uh, when we know that people were sitting uh, on and, their phones, and dining, to, yeah, and dining together and on their phones, checking mm -hmm. what happened on the yeah. world. And, and, this, uh, and, and this totally changed everything because phones, especially at the beginning, Mm -hmm. uh, weren't as fast as desktop, so that the, the experience had to be totally different. At first, mm -hmm. we even I remember that we had separate websites for mm -hmm. uh, for mobile. Yep. Just at dots. some point, exactly. Just at some point when everything started uh, changing, uh, when it comes to uh, to the battery life, to to, to mm -hmm. the CPUs and everything in, in, on the mobile phones, we could think about going responsive because uh, responsive uh, was for sure a bit more um, power draining for mobiles rather than a separate uh, version just for mobiles that was uh, lacking many things like mm -hmm. it, it had less images less mm -hmm. uh, styling less everything yep 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 it's uh you know the the web's been around we'll say like 30 years in a little bit more actually but um all there are so many things that are just discovered along the way mm -hmm. you know i'm not saying that everything is a first but you know we are you know pushing the web and the the web's capabilities further and further uh, but we're also making discoveries as we go along you know so i think these things are very uh important and you know understanding that it's like holy smokes okay this is what we need to change now or we can now do this uh and so it's really really important that people understand that there are some challenges along the way and mm -hmm. we're still making discoveries even though we seemingly have been on, on, on the web forever you know let's go back to images very quickly um you know we are hitting this turning point and it started probably a couple of years ago where capabilities are now really manifesting so that mm -hmm. you know we're able to sort of make these new image format discoveries which is you know leaving some people a little bit uncomfortable but this is technology at work you know there's nothing you can do about that yeah it changes um, it everything just changes and it uh, is what it is you know what i mean and and this is potentially the 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 sort of rough part of the transition that's taking place right now which is, you know, we're moving from particular resources to other resources. And, you know, we're going through that potential compatibility challenge that 10 years from now, we're going to laugh at, but we're just experiencing it right now. I mean, probably in 10 years, we will be going through some other change. So maybe, oh, you know, pr probably only the format will change. But um, at some point you mentioned, uh, this was... Uh, this was really interesting that we are trying to measure some things that are really hard to measure mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, and this is true, but I, I mean, I think that we can uh, look at performance in, in two aspects because there are some things that are quite easy to, to measure. I mean, the weight of, the, of our website, mm -hmm. it's exactly in kilobytes or megabytes i mean yeah. if it's in megabytes that you're probably not doing the best job <laughs> this is the first thing but yeah but uh, also there are things that are more difficult but mm -hmm. still they are measured in some way so how how we can how we can measure it how uh, and how you should and how we should uh, look at those results because uh, it's not so obvious it's 
sadly, it's not that if the lighthouse is showing us that we are green, that's perfect, and it's red, that it's horrible, because yeah. it's not that easy. Yeah, it absolutely is not. And, you know, uh, I've talked about this before, and I'm sure, you know, you've recognized it, and, you know, we're not the only ones sort of discussing this. Um, development is actually, let me start with a quote, in fact, and if I could remember this uh, word for word, I'll be so happy. Uh, but uh, Douglas Crockford, uh, a technologist uh, programmer, uh, had compared, uh, how did it go? Um, he said that the front end is the most hostile territory, something along those lines. Uh, and it's so true. You know, um, and I'll even take him back to a little bit more history. Um, Steve Souders, who for the better part is known as um, one of the most, uh, one of the earliest uh, supporters of the idea of web performance and everything that was involved in, in, in having a, a site load fast. Um, he essentially made a discovery um, that the majority of performance issues were in the front end, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, once you start to have that understanding uh, and the resources that are involved in, you know, in managing uh, a load and in managing a, a, a viewport that has to show you information, you see all the touch points, right? And everything that has to take place in sync, like a symphony, you know, if someone's offbeat or the note is wrong, you're like, what's going on? Did he not read his, his music sheet properly? What's happening? The same thing is happening with a page load. So things have to happen in a very perfect order to have that perfect user experience that I talked about. So once you start to see that, the order of a resource loading or resources loading can affect web performance. Um, that yeah, the order... understanding because some are blocking and some are not. And this is, I mean, when you will understand this simple fact of that some resources are blocking and some are not, Yep. Uh, this and is one a... of the most important discoveries you will ever get. For example, and... CSS is always blocking. Quite often it can be, you know, but if you do, uh, and you know, with due diligence, you can sort of manage that resource, exactly. you know, loading. Now you, you mentioned the blocking, you know, how do you measure blocking? You know, that, 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 that's one of the metrics that, you know, you were talking about. It's like web performance, like what happens? And, you know, these are the things that, again, these very smart engineers have been able to sort of, you know, quantify. Um, so it, it gets down to some of these, you know, new metrics that I'm sure we could talk about. And sorry, I'm just looking down because I saw some some stuff in the chat come up. Um, but um, but yeah, you know, these are the difficulties of the modern web development landscape. Um, and you know, so we talked about you know simple things like you know loading A to B. We know we could just use a stopwatch, but how do you measure, you know, something like uh, TBT, uh, which is a metric, uh, uh, one of the six main metrics that you that you get, uh, and which is um, total blocking time. You know, these are things that had to be sort of like, you know, figured out and measured, and and you have to understand that total blocking time will also sort of like push your load time further, and then ultimately affect this user experience that we're trying to manage. You know, um, how do you, you know, we, we started to talk about things like, um, I don't know, like time to first bite, you know, very old mm -hmm. metric, but these are things that you want to keep in mind. You had to measure how long it took for that first bite to come back to the server because that really can set you off to either a good experience or a bad one, you know. Um, we start to talk about paint metrics, you know, and people are like, paint metrics, what's going on there? You know, and I'm still remembering, you know, some of the early discussions that are being had, and I was following this, like, intently. Um, and, you know, we have the first Contentful Paint, the largest Contentful Paint. There was actually a third metric at the time, uh, but it became so hard to manage, and, you know, they saw, like, little errors mm -hmm. in, in its 
implementation. So it essentially um, got removed. But, you know, these are things that we now also have to measure. And, you know, something like your largest contentful paint, you know, to think about, it's kind of like bizarre, but you start to understand what it means to have a good large contentful paint once you start to you know, get mm -hmm. a bigger picture. And, you know, you and I talked about this already, the idea of web performance literacy, you know, understanding the, the, the significant parts of a performance uh, symphony, you know, getting back to the music that I talked about and how everything has to be in sync. Um, and once you start to understand that, you start to look at and sort of, you know, um, development differently, um, and understand when you look at these numbers, like when you're doing, say, like a profiling on web page test, you're like, oh, I see something weird happening here. Or better yet, the waterfall that we talked mm -hmm. about again, you know, people, I don't think, um, are extracting the most information as, uh, as they can out of a waterfall because that could also be very telling in terms of what's happening mm -hmm. with your page, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I may have gone in circles there, but there's so much to talk about. And, and I do realize that people um, can get seemingly a little frustrated, but it's really sitting down and sort of understanding what each part, what each metric represents, looking at a waterfall and understanding what could be taking place when you start to look at things that are in line. Um, but that's also why... Uh, and again, I mean, I, I, I'm not here to necessarily plug web page tests, but we have a set of, of tooling and some features that can visually help you identify what some of the issues are, right? Um, you know, yeah. so, and I'll, before I, 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 I move, we move on, and I just want to give you a quick example. I talked about, you know, the 100 meter race. Um, you know, if I look at one person, because, you know, it's eight lanes, right? Uh, and if I look at one person go from, like, the start to the finish line, I'd be like, oh, I, I, I think that person's fast, looked fast. You'll have a better idea once you see that person versus seven others. And then you'll start to see and understand who's faster. And, you know, when it comes to getting back to the waterfall, you can see what loaded quickly and what did not, you know? So I get back to the idea of just kind of like having that literacy uh, and being able to, uh, to look at so charts, data, uh, performance data, and just understanding it. Yeah. And um, by the way, uh, I was also, uh, I'm still also a big uh, web page test uh, fan because uh, as you mentioned, those tools are really great because the moment when you start comparing websites all together, uh, sometimes you can see that until some point your website is faster, so it's easier to find which things worked and which were done better uh, at, uh, with some other frameworks, other tools, because uh, we already can see the difference even looking at the waterfall, at the waterfalls, uh, which framework uh, was used? Uh, because you quite often mentioned on, on, on Twitter uh, that especially many JavaScript frameworks behave in a bit different way rather than typical HTML. Because, because with HTML, we can see that all the things appears out one after another. So we can see that uh, first the text loads, then the font changes, images start loading, and so on and so on. And what happens with, with, with many JavaScript frameworks? Well, I mean, I think that with um, any platform, whether it be a, 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 a JavaScript framework or CMS or anything of the sort, um, you know, part of the decision-making, uh, I mean, there could be a multitude of reasons why you may pick one over another. Um, but the one thing that we tend to keep an eye on in web performance are patterns, you know, are, um, you know, repeating patterns in terms of, 
um, you know, understanding that a particular framework has a tendency to uh, react like this uh, or react like that. Um, and this is no attack on React, but I just thought it was a very interesting, <laughs> you know, uh, choice of words. The point I'm trying to make is this, um, you know, we, we talked about all the things that you want to make sure you, you, you sort of understand. And, you know, if there's one thing I want to make sure that you take away of the few things, but the one thing for sure uh, I'm going to say is um, you have to understand that web performance is um, an auditing, you know, to understand what's going on on the page. Uh, it's a bit of a, a, a dark art. But ultimately, it's like investigative work. Um, consider yourself a, you know, like Sherlock Holmes, uh, a police officer, and you're trying to piece together the scene of the crime, you know. And some criminals have particular patterns, you know, because they tend to you know, rob a bank at the same time, you know, right before they close, you know, and you start to see these patterns. Well, particular frameworks will sometimes act in a particular way and you can start to see these patterns. You might be like, hey, this looks like such and such. Or they're loading, you know, a pile of this and I know framework X operates like that as well. So this is why, you know, uh, again, I get back to the idea that it's investigative work and, you know, frameworks tend to have sometimes um, these particular, you know, patterns that you can start to recognize. Um, a fantastic um, uh, performance uh, engineer by the name of uh, Andy Davies, um, he was on a podcast years ago with a former coworker who actually had on a stream a few weeks ago by the name of Simon Hearns and uh, Simon Hearn, pardon me, I'll talk about that afterwards. Mm -hmm. And they did a podcast together. Uh, and I think they did like two or three episodes. Um, they used to work at this company called the NCC Group um, that worked in performance in that, actually. But I never forgot this. Uh, and Andy mentioned something about the you know well regarded performance engineers and people who audit um the good ones will recognize patterns because they've done so many and they can start to pick out what the issues are and where they come from mm -hmm. you know yeah. these are the patterns that i'm talking about you know you um, mentioned earlier that you work in um specifically in the wordpress uh environment uh, ecosystem. Uh, WordPress has particular patterns, you know, exactly. and, and you start to recognize these. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to throw some out uh, real quickly. Um, you know, uh, for everyone in the chat, and, and I know uh, there was one question I wanted to get to in a hot second, but, you know, uh, everyone listening and watching, um, for example, like the, the median uh, Lighthouse score across the web, around like 8 million sites, mm -hmm. um, is 41, mm -hmm. um, which, yes, folks, that is a failing grade, um, but the median one for WordPress is 26, if I'm correct. Um, and that could be for a number of reasons, but once you start to look at some of these sites individually, you start to see patterns, and these are the things that we talk about. Mm -hmm. I'm actually working on a presentation around WordPress and performance specifically, and I'm going to deep dive in some of these patterns and numbers to start to connect the dots, you know, because, you know, we could talk about um, the median amount of uh, resources uh, that a WordPress site has, and we can start to connect the dots to the particular performance score or the, 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 the sort of um, anti-patterns that, that take mm -hmm. place uh, that end up in this sort of like uh, low score, right? Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And as, especially that uh, one of the things with WordPress is the fact that many users 
uh, use plugins without without thinking, which which in results gives them uh, lots of unnecessary JavaScript, CSS files, which in results uh, give uh, gives us this uh, twenty six right. Uh, you know, so, yeah, so. And, and, and that's it. You know, um, I I never want to uh, lay immediate blame uh, on folks. But uh, I get back to what I mentioned earlier, which is the literacy element of web performance, right? Um, you know, we could talk about literacy of the web in general, you know, and understand how the web, the web operates, how it functions, how it functions best, you know. So, you know, we talked about the history of, of, of web performance. Uh, and, you know, I want to touch on this real quickly. Um, some of the earliest documentation um, that came out, uh, and I mentioned um, his name, one of the authors, uh, Steve Souders, um, who worked at Yahoo, I believe, at the time. But he came out with two well-regarded uh, books, uh, both about web performance. Um, the, worst, the first one being called, um, I think it was um, High Performing Websites uh, or High Performance Websites. And the second one was called uh, Even Faster Websites, uh, I think it was called. But, you know, the first book, he had a set of rules, you know, uh, and I hate to call them rules, but, you know, uh, we could just call them best practices, actually. Um, and, you know, he talked about um, some very sort of like, you know, simple practices that 15 years later today, because this book came out around 2007, are still the case, you know. So, for example, um, you know, we have a, a famous saying in web performance, which is um, the quickest request is the one that's never made, right? Um, so if you don't need the request to be made, don't make it. You know, some of the fastest websites are pretty light on requests, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and the ones that aren't, you'll see these long waterfalls that look like wallpaper. You know, yeah. uh, in, in some of the audits uh, uh, I've, 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 I've done over our webpage tests with some guests, uh, we've seen some with like 700 requests on first load. Do you realize what that means? 700 requests? That's a lot. That's a, that's a lot. And I mean, a lot, a lot. And especially, okay, now with HTTP2, it, it's a bit easier to... Uh, to do something with this, but before this, when we had the limitations of uh, of parallel connections, yeah. it was a disaster. Yeah, and you know, you mentioned HTTP two. Um, the, the the very interesting part of that is that uh, yes, it was welcomed with you know open arms. You know, after decades, it seems of HTTP one. And, and all its limitations and, you know, the six connections at a time, max and, and all that. HTTP 2 came around with um, what people believe uh, the biggest feature, which was multiplexing, you know, being able mm -hmm. to open one connection and just stuff all the resources down the pipe as you could. Um, but that came with its own challenges and shout outs to, I think it was Andy Davies and um, Mr. Patrick Meenan, who... Uh, discovered that you know servers had to be tuned to uh, work with H HTTP2 as best as possible mm -hmm. and not a lot were. So um, you still had some challenges uh, and limitations with H2 um, that were actually eye-opening. Um, and so we went from like many years of H1.1 to H2 for like five, five or six, maybe even seven years uh, at this point. Uh, and now we're definitely in this H3 conversation, right? Uh, but every time we're just trying to make things as quick and as uh, friction free as possible, you know, and we're talking about zero RTT now, uh, round trip times, by the way. Uh, so mm -hmm. things that seem as instantaneous as possible. Um, but again, you know, all that to improve that user experience. Um, I mean, I, I'm going to, I, I want to go down and answer this one question here because I think I remember it came up uh, quickly. From, from I, Nikolai? Yes, from exactly. Nikolai. This, 
What do you think is the next steps in the web evolution, like with handheld devices evolution that you've mentioned? So, you know, that's a great question, you know, and um, it's funny because um, I thought about this recently again uh, for a couple reasons. So the first evolution is the fact that um, we are absolutely in a handheld world, you know, um, you have to like that is your baseline. You know, you're not designing for the desktop. You're like, you know, we are in a handheld world. It is what it is. Um, now, what ends up happening is that you have this massive delta between the devices that are on the network right now. You know, um, believe it or not, I'm on an iPhone 7. You know, I know people are whistling in the chat right now. I'm like, Woo, what are you doing with that old phone? <laughs> you know? Um, and yes, some people are on the iPhone 13, but there's some people who are on the iPhone 5, you know, and one thing that I discovered in, in some of my research and, you know, thank God there's some people out there doing this research so I can read it, um, is that, you know, we tend to in more or less developed, you know, world, uh, tend to get our phone and when we're not happy with it anymore, we just put it down and we get a new phone, you know. And that old phone, we might we might sell it, but sometimes it just sits around, you know. Um, in some territories, these phones just get passed down, you know, to friends, family, kids. Mm -hmm. And so you end up with these old phones on the network and people are like, what is this phone doing here? You know, it's still operating because the web should work and it probably does on some of these older devices you know so what you end up happening uh, uh, you end up having is this massive range of devices that mm -hmm. are on the web some that are handling the web as it is fairly well and others that are not you know and you know we are keeping this in mind um there are a couple things out there that really made me realize that you know the web is a phone first um uh sort of um kind of uh, uh content mm -hmm. um what i just mentioned you know phones getting passed down um also it, it never really worked and didn't sell well but i don't know if you remember that uh, that samsung dex thing where yeah you... your phone could be your computer i thought i was like something's gonna happen here because if you could get like a hundred dollar you know monitor and just drop your phone on there and just suddenly have like this home desktop thing but it's still the phone as the guts you know mm -hmm. to me they're onto something but you know in in the spirit of trying to sell phones they kept it to like high end, higher end, you know, yeah. phones and, and whatnot. And that could have been a, a couple reasons, but that made me think a lot. And um, I actually also found uh, a patent um, application uh, by Apple that was uh, imagine a empty, uh, a laptop that was like an empty shell. And then you would just put the phone in it and turn it into a laptop. And I remember seeing that, and my mind was like, <laughs> it's over. <laughs> it's a phone world. So, you know, to get back to your question, uh, Nikolai, um, it, it, this is where it's going. Um, and this is why um, resource loading is super important. You know, uh, if you ever get a chance, uh, someone like Alex Russell, who uh, has been the biggest proponent of uh, resource management, especially JavaScript, uh, in light of what JavaScript does to uh, the experience and devices in general, um, you know, you start to realize how the best experiences um, have the JavaScript resource loading managed well, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, because JavaScript is that one resource that would just lock everything up on your phone. Yeah. You know, you could tap the screen and nothing's happening. JavaScript, you know. Exactly. Uh, total blocking time, quite often enough, JavaScript, you know. 
Um, I know you mentioned core up vitals, you know, um, so uh, even though, uh, you know, there are three figures, right? So you have your mm -hmm. um, uh, LCP, which is your largest contentful paint. Um, you have your CLS, uh, which is your cumulative, cumulative layout shift. Um, and then you have your FID, uh, first input delay, which they're playing with the idea of potentially not having that anymore. Mm -hmm. We can talk about that afterwards. Um, you know, and, you know, because they're talking about a responsive, uh, a responsiveness uh, metric right now, um, we could put that in the show notes. Um, but, you know, shockingly, you know, FID, a first input delay, that has like a little bit of sort of, uh, you know, a JavaScript element to it. Mm -hmm. Shockingly, it's a score that people seem to um, hit relatively well. Uh, but I also believe that they're not sure if this is the right metric to use uh, because um, the way JavaScript can affect a page and lock up uh, the CPU or thread is absolutely toxic. You know, um, if you look at some of the results when you do a audit um, and you'll see that, you know, total blocking time sometimes is just like off the charts. You know, uh, and again, these things don't tend to manifest that much on a desktop because that's what we're using to test a site. But on a person's device, that's not going to work well. You know. Yeah. Um, so that that's why we talk about like the the sort of like the management, the the um, uh, what did I say earlier? Uh, oh my God, the uh, oh, it's going to come back to me. Anyways, keep going. Yeah, so um, what do you think has the biggest impact on, or on performance? Because uh, we mentioned already uh, loosely a few, a, a few things, but um, you know the numbers. You know the numbers. You did uh, a lot more audits than, than I. So what are the things and how to, how to fix them? Absolutely. Well, I mean, let's look at the... Um... You know, I talked about the core of vitals. Let's talk about the core of vitals real, real, uh, very quickly. Um, I mean, I was just reading uh, a couple of days ago, and um, I was looking at some data uh, from uh, Jean-Michel Marsavril. We're in April right now, right? So the March data, Crux data, the March Crux data, by the way, which is a Chrome user experience report, mm -hmm. and they come out with data indicating like what they're seeing on the web and um, uh, across like about 8 million sites plus. And, um, oh man, maybe I should pull it up. Um, let me see. I don't want to, you know, screw up this uh, stream, but I might be able to uh, see if I could find it again. Or oh, it might be on a different laptop. Okay, you know what? I'm going to come back to the stream. Don't worry. But, um, so I mentioned the three um, uh, data points of core vitals. So... Um, large contentful paint, uh, FID, and the CLS. Um, the one metric that sites fail consistently is the largest contentful paint. Uh, mm -hmm. And I believe under 40% of sites have good um, LCP. And um, if you are, um, you know, understandably someone who may look at, you know, your Lighthouse score uh, and say, okay, what's going on here? Um, the, your your large contentful paint is going to be worth, uh, and I, I don't want to sit there and say, like, this is how you have to look at it, but I want you on, to understand it. Um, it's going to be worth 25% of your score, you know? So if you're failing that, We'll say you're, you know, at forty percent. Um, if you do the math, that's about ten points out of twenty-five, mm -hmm. right? So right away, it's not looking good, and um, and that has to do quite often uh, with a few things, but quite often enough with images. Mm 
And so if you start to mismanage things like images, and especially your hero image, um, a lot of things can go south and very quickly. Um, I had a, um, um, I ran a couple of sort of, uh, I, I don't want to call it conference, but it was like an extended meetup uh, around images. And I've had two um, talks, uh, presentations uh, around it. And one by the name, uh, one developer by the name of Patrick Hulse, shout outs, Patrick. Um, he has a talk called, This is Your LCP on Images, uh, which I think is a cute play on the, you know, your mind on drugs, whatever. And he tells you, you have very limited, you have a narrow window to get that image right. It's got to be, I think, under a particular amount of uh, kilobytes mm -hmm. before you start to lose points, if you want to look at it that way, you know, before your LCP starts to just, you know, go, go south score-wise. Um, and, you know, there are several ways to, to fix that. One of them is to make sure that you manage that resource in particular, because if that's going to be your biggest resource loading in the viewport, which is essentially what your largest contentful paint is going to be, you want to make sure you manage that well. So if you have a hero image uh, in the viewport that comes in early, you want that to come in fast. So there are ways of handling that through some resource loading tricks, but you also want to optimize that image as best as possible, uh, a, a modern format, and you know make sure that it's sized properly. You could also do something like have your large contentful page be text-based, right? Mm -hmm. There's no reason why you have to have an image in the background because it's going to be your biggest resource loading. It could just be text loading. And generally, largest contentful paint that's text-based is probably going to come in fairly quickly if you're slick about it. Uh, because, you know, you could preload that uh, and preloading text tends to, you know, be uh, a, a less of a burdensome, a burdensome endeavor than uh, an image. And that'll come in very quickly. You know, again, uh, adding to the user experience that we want because the user is going to see content on the page coming in fairly fast. And it's like the headline, you know, uh, uh I don't know. It could be anything. And it's like, okay, now I see what's going on and adding to the user experience um, that we talked about. And so you can get like a good LCP. Um, so those are very low. I shouldn't say low, but those are relatively low hanging fruits in terms of getting your LCP up, which in turn will lift your score in general. And I say that, and I spent time on the LCP because, again, I get back to the fact that, again, we can put this in the show notes, that the LCP is the one that developers seem to be screwing up the most. And that's just the data. You know, this is not hocus pocus magic. You know, I'm just sharing the data with you. Okay, to be honest, this is, this is interesting. I, I never thought that LCP is the... The one that is failed the most, but on the, on the on the other hand, uh, what else? What else? <laughs> I mean, um, I, I just think it, it's it's managing resources as much as possible. You know, you can't improve what you can't measure. You know, so mm -hmm. if uh, you know, <laughs> so Chris Coyer uh, would every so often would say something like, "Oh, you you say it's such and such. Well, prove it then." You know. And uh, and uh, from time from time to time you'll see me on Twitter get cute and I'll say like oh you're fast we'll prove it show us the web page stuff you know uh, and that's for you not just so much for me it's for the developer to understand like you can't go around saying that you're fast and when you're potentially not um, and you know uh, I encourage everyone out there to just go out and you know. There are a bunch of ways. So, you know, you're, you've, you're deployed, you're live, all good. Um, test it. You know, see what's going on. Look at what, what's loading, how uh, there's some things that will escape you. That's without a doubt, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. And you'll be able to make uh, 
uh, the appropriate changes. It's about testing as well, you know, being able to look at particular resource strategies and maybe they're going to work well, maybe they're not. Conflicts happen under the hood. You know, browsers, by the way, I wish I could find this quote and I'll probably put it in the show notes. Uh, someone had said once, the browser is the greatest piece of software bar none. I actually agreed. Because if you start to understand what the browser is doing for a page to look nice on your phone screen, like you'd be shocked, you know. Uh, so the browsers, as smart as they are, they have to make a lot of decisions very quickly. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, they might override something that you'd mentioned, you know, that you coded in, but other days they will not. And then you spot these mistakes. So, you know, testing is going to be important because you're going to be able to see what the issues are. Um, as you test, the only way you can see the issue is to have that literacy that I talked about, being able to read that page and be like, mm -hmm. okay, I see that this is wrong, so I got to fix that. Um, and you know what, adhering to some very, you know, simple principles, you know, like image management, you know, years ago, that didn't seem like a big deal, but it absolutely is right now because you're on devices, you're on, you know, ordinary networks, you know, yes, you may be on 4G and sometimes 5G in certain cities, metropolises, uh, metropolitan cities, um, but, for example, uh, and this I read this today, um, you know, apparently Netflix is in trouble. You know, they're not getting more. They're, they're losing subscribers and stuff like that. Oh, no, no, no. It wasn't Netflix. It was another um, streaming uh, um, channel. And someone in the comments in, uh, had said that uh, they're in small town America and they don't have good bandwidth and you know mm -hmm. people were making fun of this person but this is absolutely true there are parts of the world even the developed world where bandwidth is not that accessible yeah exactly i mean and uh, we are talking as, as you said third world countries that are, they are just outside the big cities <laughs> yep 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 some so, so, sometimes it's very it's, it's it's even very close it's just there's no cable, there is no 5G, nothing. Yep, it just absolutely. happened. Absolutely. Listen, um, here's another stat for you. The top three countries for um, low-end devices, you know, so not immediately iPhones, what do you think? Three countries. I think that they're low-end. I think there were something from, from, from Europe. There, there were some, like, if I remember, right? So... Um, I believe number one was India. And this is from about, this data is about three to mm -hmm. four years old, you know, because I remember I was watching our presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, India was one. Um, surprising to me, uh, I believe number two was Russia. Bad word around here now. So, uh, but number three was America, United States. Well, this is a surprise, but still, uh, it's an enormous country. So, statistics, statistics volume, you know, of like exactly. low end phones being sold. So, these things start to like open up your eyes, right? And you start to understand that, you know, it, it, the average person may be carrying a, um, a very average device. And in mm -hmm. fact, um, you know, I could probably point to uh, this in the show notes too. You'll have to remind me of our, everything that mm -hmm. I've talked about in terms of <laughs> putting in the show notes. Um, a, a good friend of mine, um, Aaron, what's Aaron's last name? He works at Fastly. Turner, Aaron Turner. Mm -hmm. um, real life experience, he talked about um, uh, not having the most disposable income and being given a very low-end phone, but it was a phone nonetheless that he could use. And he talks about that experience in a talk that he has. And it was just as low as it got. $100 phone, but it was a phone. Um, and there were a lot of these phones being distributed in America. Mm 
you know mm-hmm. uh, it was part of a program where people could uh, could be given a smartphone uh, but it was like the lowest of the low ends so these things are around and so that's why you know web performance is important web performance is the resource management of of, of things that are loading onto the page uh, because or into the viewport because like i said you don't know what the uh how powerful these devices are and uh you want to make sure that they're given just the resources that they need for this page to you know populate the viewport as smoothly as possible yeah yeah ov- ov- overall this is um this is a very interesting thing, and it comes from 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 the things that you mentioned at the beginning. Uh, many people think about perfor- performance as numbers, mm-hmm. just as numbers. And the thing that uh, you talk, especially now, about those uh, cheap phones, and that yes, this is not an exact science. I I mean, yes, we can talk about use modern formats. Uh, remember about setting the correct headers and using. Uh, a correct server and yes of course this will have a huge impact by the way always remember about using uh, zip or using web compression or, yeah. yeah yeah i mean zipping broccoli. There, there are hundreds of tutorials uh which configuration will be the best for your technological stack because uh it will look totally different depending on which server will you use or which application you are using or many, many other things. But uh, there are so many things that are so either hard to measure or for many developers hard to imagine because we also have to remember that uh, we as developers mostly uh, work on better computers, on better mm-hmm. phones. We mm-hmm. have a totally different perspective uh, mm-hmm. on it. I mean, yes, we statistically earn better, so we are spending this on tools yep. on which we work because yep. this we is natural. We eat very that... well. <laughs> exactly. But on the other hand, our end users, uh, there is an uh, enormous chance we'll use something exactly opposite yep. that we have so yeah so to be honest your uh, your way of using an older phone uh, is a very practical way to test the performance all the time in some mm-hmm. way on, on a, just an older phone that's it yep i mean it's the reason why um you know whether you look at web page tests or even other applications like lighthouse and whatnot their base testing model is usually about 3G uh, mm-hmm. connection, you know, so you can, exactly. you know, uh, a synthetic 3G uh, connection uh, and a uh, moderate phone, you know, so uh, the, the, the CPU is throttled, the connection mm-hmm. is throttled. So, you know, you want to convey that experience as much as possible because, again, the old adage that, you know, we're on a desktop computer and, you know, that's already powerful and then, you know, we have amazing, inter- uh, you know, connection. Like, I'm hardwired right here, you know. I, mm-hmm. I, don't, do, I don't do Wi-Fi, you know. Mm-hmm. I'm a snob. But, uh, but the reality is having a phone outdoors you know the 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 network connection is anything can happen you know how do you how do you replicate walking in between buildings brick buildings you know what i mean like yeah exactly these, these are things that happen like you walking in and out of a building and you know being in the middle of a transaction you know you can't replicate that in in a mm-hmm. sort of closed environment so um, that's why you try to make things as friction free as possible. And that means, you know, loading resources as they're needed and not dumping everything down the wire. Right. Um, but you're not going to notice these things without testing, you know, without exactly. doing an audit, without understanding what is taking place uh, on your page. You know, are you, you know, loading images that you don't need? You know, because, for example, um, the majority of people don't go to the bottom of a page, if that even exists now. <laughs> you know, it'll be like pages don't end now, right? Uh, 
But yeah, in the, the the infinite scroll. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but you want to make sure that it's not the infinite load, right? You're not loading all these images that are just, mm -hmm. you know, uh, coded into a page. You know, you don't want them loading if they're not going to be part of the viewport, mm -hmm. you know? So lazy loading, you know, and, you know, I, I we could have talked about, you know, the, the, the browsers, what they're doing to help us out with that, all these new performance APIs that are out there specifically to address these issues because again these are discoveries that are made a long time as the web has matured right lazy loading wasn't available to us 10 years ago at least i don't think so you know but we mm -hmm. realized it was an issue uh and it went from lazy loading libraries to now lazy loading being baked into the browser because we needed it exactly Exactly. Uh, by the way, la lazy loading also created some 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 problems because uh, lazy loading an image that is right away uh, in our viewport when yeah. we load will will also cause yeah. So this is this is also one one of the examples that there are no simple solutions. Uh, we have to test it. We have to test it because. Uh, just because, yeah. We, we, uh, absolutely. Well, and, and that's it. You know, you you won't realize that you've added a lazy loading attribute to your hero image that is, you know, part of your LCP score. So, you know, I compare it to, you know, driving with the handbrake on. You know, you're just, yeah. <laughs> it's just not going to work. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, we also have two questions, two extra yeah. questions that we got from uh, from from people who, uh, who who added them during signing up. Mm -hmm. So we have one from James. Assuming you are going to mention Web Core Vitals in the webinar, is there a way in body to monitor test those on site? So uh, yes, there is, but partially, because we have a lighthouse action, so you can have. Uh, you can test the lighthouse scores as a part of your pipeline, which is a, a very good practice because you will know every time when something changed. Uh, but we don't have all the metrics. We are working on it. So at some point it will be released. I hope it will be released sooner than later. So it's more a question to me and for you. Why does the site performance need to be monitored like regularly? I have noticed that if the site is left for too long, its performance decreases. And this is a very interesting question because uh, it, it can have many answers. Regressions happen. Actually, it's funny you should mention that because, um, you know, as uh, was mentioned earlier uh, by myself and yourself, and, you know, if you've not noticed my uh, handle on the page, I'm at Web Page Test. Uh, and uh, we j actually just, uh, I was supposed to release this uh, this little video uh, with one of our uh, team members. Um, shout outs, Michaela Reddy. Um, she talked to one of our engineers about regressions, you know, and, and why it's important and, you know, why it's also important to have performance budgets. You know, that's, again, an, another topic we could probably uh, dabble into uh, at some point. But um, regressions happen, you know, people get on, um, you know, you, you, you have a code base that potentially, uh, you know, several, like an entire team is working on. Uh, and before you know it, you know some ad some updates are made, and 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 if they're not tested regularly, you may not notice these things, you know. And you talked about automation. Uh, there's so many ways to get that notification now. You might get a Slack saying like, "Hey, yeah. you know, there's a regression here. What happened? <laughs> you know, come back." Um, and these things can happen. Like you know, we talked about um, so. Uh, we do a uh, bi-monthly, or is it bi-weekly? I think it means the same thing. Uh, so twice a month, we do a stream, usually. Um, and the last stream, we had uh, a gentleman by the name of Simon Hearns, and we talked about uh, third parties. Uh, and we talked about how the ad network, and we briefly went into how that works, because I wasn't that well-versed in it. But once you have these arrangements with these ad network companies, um, what loads onto your page is completely unknown to you. You just know that you have a deal 
you know, you've signed the dotted line with a company that says, I'm going to provide ads on your page and you'll be able to make this, you know, extra money. Well, you know, once you start to see what's happening behind the curtains, under the hood with these ads that they even don't know are coming up, it's bad news, you know. So you start to understand that monitoring what's happening on a more consistent basis is mm -hmm. required, you know, uh, and regressions can happen. You know, if you want to maintain a, uh, you know, a load that's going to be under a meg, a lot of things can happen for that to not uh, stay at where it's supposed mm -hmm. to be. Um, I, I was just going to give you an example, uh, and I just forgot. Um, let me see. I was going to talk about Simon Hearn and uh, stuff loading onto a page, and we don't know what's happening. Ah, anyways, but you know, this is uh, this is basically what can happen, and um, and and again, I get back to the third party and the advertising levels. Um, Here's a, another example that just came to mind. Um, the same site may load completely differently in America and then in Europe. Yeah, so exactly. The, the server yeah. from 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 which the test is uh, on which it's happening it can can change everything. Also, let's not forget about one more thing: uh, the lighthouse scores also evolves and changes. I remember that the first day they introduced the Core Web Vitals, most of the scores went went down. Mm -hmm. Or on the other hand, when at some point, uh, I don't remember which was which was it uh, exactly, but they introduced uh, something from HTTP2 as a standard uh, when, when it comes to testing. Mm -hmm. And suddenly scores went up. Mm -hmm. So we didn't change anything. Nothing went bad. Just the algorithm, the way they are testing changed. And, uh, and our score just can change overnight without any any reason. But also the fact that you mentioned, uh, because there are many unknowns on our website, all those third parties. Mm -hmm. You know, we are so just providing the dynamic URL, and uh, the file on the other hand can change. And yep, we have a web page. We have this uh, uh, integration with this uh, tool called Request Map. You know, which mm -hmm. essentially shows you. Um, what is taking place uh, at a page load, uh, and um, and everything that you know gets requested in the background. Um, some you're aware of, but a lot you're not. You know, and this can change again depending on the, your your arrangement with your ad network. Uh, can mm -hmm. change without um, you knowing. And you know what you believe should be like a I don't know one and a half meg load. Uh, page load could be like five because uh, some, you know, uh, an, an ad is now the one that, you know, a seasonal change to an ad now on your page, an ad that wasn't um, optimized properly. Mm -hmm. um, and you have actually companies, you know, that have teams that work with clients to optimize their ads as best as possible because that's another uh, layer to a problem right so mm -hmm. uh, and that's all connected back to your site that you feel because you we, know, we we already know from from many research that uh, the fastest the site loads the bigger chance that we will buy something absolutely like you know we could talk about that e-commerce uh the, the e-com element to to that whole uh, experience because you know you don't want to lose uh, a potential customer to to what like uh, a third party that you had like no control over. Shout outs to Tammy Everts. Um, she had written a book. Um, uh, I believe it was called, uh, and we'll put this in the show notes too again. Uh, I don't mean to give you all this work, right? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, show notes, show notes, show notes. Uh, <laughs> but um, I think she called it Time is Money. And she basically mm -hmm. talks about um, how a web performance is connected to commerce. You know, um, today, in fact, uh, someone had tweeted me about something, uh, and I uh, brought up um, something else that we'll put in the show notes. Uh, it is uh, wpostats.com. Uh, 
Uh, mm -hmm. It's a website that she curated with a coworker of mine, Tim Cadillac, and they talked about the connection of commerce and performance. And uh, they are case studies, a, a set of case studies where companies talk about, you know, the positive impact of web performance on their bottom line. You know, so something that you want to check out uh, as much as possible. Um, but yeah, I mean, super duper important. Uh, it's the reason why uh, Shopify has a performance team, you know, mm -hmm. a dedicated e-com site uh, or e-commerce provider um, has a dedicated team that looks after performance uh, consistently. Shout outs Colin Bendel in the building. Uh, we so also know how much uh, money Amazon invests in it invested mm -hmm. in it because uh, they were the first that uh, started talking about it. I don't mm -hmm. remember mm -hmm. anyone before them. So yeah. Amazon, um, in fact, you know, as you say that, because I talked about that case, um, which was on the WPOStats.com website, um, I brought in someone else into the conversation because Walmart had also published a very uh, famous study around that, uh, around that um, concept of making sure that they were, um, fast uh and i could put that in the show notes too um you know I, I i've talked about the idea that i would spend time on amazon.com um not to buy anything but just because i knew it was a pretty fast experience and i could mm -hmm. just browse and not be annoyed you know yeah uh, so yeah that that certainly uh, has a lot of uh to say and do around um performance Okay, I think that uh, we talk about so many things. Uh, the, the bad news is that there are still so many things left because uh, performance is such a wide topic. Mm -hmm. We can do a, a special episode on, on e-commerce, on optimizing some exact cases. So yeah. if, if someone is interested in listening to them, just uh, tweet us or or contact us in, in any way, and we will think about uh, how to pursue uh, the topic next. Because, uh, yeah, it's it's, it's, it's 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 very wide, and it's much more than just numbers. So, uh, much more. I mean, if you yes. do commerce, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if you know, I mean, I think uh, they could be compatriots, uh, the good people at View Commerce. View, View Commerce? View Commerce? View commerce? Storefront. View Storefront. Oh, yeah, Storefront. Yeah. Um, they are big uh, supporters of the idea of having proper web performance at the mm -hmm. e-com level. Um, so it's uh, they, they probably have a lot to say there as well. Yeah, so we have uh, like a lot of topics to to cover in the in, in the upcoming webinar. So mm -hmm. for sure we will be back with the with the with, with the performance topic. Yeah. Uh, for now a really big thanks for uh, for sharing for, for sharing everything i mean not everything because i know that you know a lot more but sadly we we, we only had this one one hour to to talk about it no problem. and and i wanted to mention about a few things because like i mentioned at the start we mentioned the uh the poll about the favorite image format you use on your websites and web p1 and on the second the second place was to buy JPEG, PNG, and, S and SVG both on there. No one wanted to use AVIV yet. Oh, but, okay. But Interesting. maybe in a year or two, we'll see that AVIV will be fighting alongside with uh, WebP or who knows what will, yeah, yeah. Uh, what will happen. Uh, apart from this, uh, on May the 4th, so it will be... Uh, Really, we, we really have to do a Star Wars uh, edition of I was the webinar. Say. Yeah, because it's my, May, May the Fourth with exactly. the, with the Pantheon Multi Dev and Body Integration. We will talk about the perfect WordPress development combo together with Hausa uh, from 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 the Pantheon's um, awesome de developer Devrel team. Yeah. Uh, a Apart from this, uh, remember about our meetup group. Uh, you can sign up there and uh, be informed about the upcoming uh, webinars. Absolutely. And like I mentioned before, if you like what we are doing, if you would like to uh, listen more often to, 
to such great guests as as Henri, subscribe to our channel so so we know that you like to that, that you like our our work, our webinars, and you want more. Also, we mentioned uh, in all the chats on on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube our Discord channel. So if you would like to still talk a bit about uh, web performance, join us there. And uh, Absolutely. yeah, and I think. Yeah, and I think that's uh, that's everything for today. Um, I hope that soon we will we will s see again and talk a bit more about about uh, some aspects of performance. I mean, so, what I'd love to do is uh, when I'm done um, a little bit of uh, that research that I was talking about, uh, and for a, a talk that I have coming up. I'd love to potentially come back and, and deep dive and share some of the findings, uh, which would be specifically WordPress and performance related, like nothing else uh, and everything that's, well, I shouldn't say everything, um, a lot that's involved in, in that uh, conversation. But and um, we could try to automate some fixes for for the problems. And uh, this is, absolutely. yeah, this is what we have to do. This is, so, Absolutely, and and you know the next thing I was going to say is uh, uh, I definitely want to make sure that uh, we have that conversation that uh, we've we've hashed up already. But you know the the API conversation and having potentially a, a demo of how that could be fixed for um, automated for uh, sort of uh, the WordPress developers out there who kind of want to take their performance uh, testing another extra step further uh, with WebPage tests and. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, kind of like the pipeline that we might be able to create there. So we, we certainly want to do uh, that, have that conversation. Um, and if I don't, you know, see you before uh, the, your big talks, I, I, I guess do people know that you're having a big talk in Europe. It, over uh, I'm not sure. I, I, I mean, I, I already shared this info on Twitter, so so, so okay. I think that that, that, that that few people know. So and yes, uh, during uh, during this workshop, I, I, when I will be showing the ultimate uh, WordPress CI/CD pipeline, of course there there will be a step of measuring the performance because uh, this is one of the most important things right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we we live in a in, in this strange time when we have so many the most important thing in web <laughs> development because we have to focus on so many things but yeah performance is is, is really one one of those that uh, mm -hmm. and and it really uh better per performance can really in an easy way convert to to money just like this and who hates money <laughs> exactly. no hands Ex up that i can tell i don't see a yeah. i don't see a hand up yeah um, exactly exactly so but, um, uh, but yeah, the so, last thing I was going to say is uh, mm -hmm. with regards to some of the data that I, I said I was going to share, uh, the one data point that I did share, w which was uh, around the uh, the median uh, Lighthouse score for uh, WordPress sites, um, that was all collected from the uh, HTTP archive, um, if mm -hmm. anyone's familiar with that. And we'll put that in the show notes. Uh, but that came back from the uh, their annual almanac that they put out uh, where they share uh, some of the most interesting uh, web data uh, that's across uh, our fantastic internet uh, right now. So, uh, and they pull and, and they go through like eight and a half million sites. So it's, it's fairly thorough in terms of uh, what you see out there. So mm -hmm. if you're interested yeah. in more of that information. Okay, so I think it's time to wrap everything up. I Thank you again. Thank you again. And it I was really can... such a pleasure. Thank you, uh, like everyone involved with having me here. Um, you know, I, I think it's a fantastic opportunity, uh, you know, to connect worlds apart. You know, I'm here in uh, North America and you are in Europe and Poland. It's like, hello, you know, and uh, <laughs> I, I think it's it's great for everyone to be able to watch and, and see and and. and uh, get some of this uh, information that we have to share. That's that's exactly true. So, uh, so thank you everyone for watching us, and uh, see you in two weeks. We will really have to think about some Star Wars theme. Mm -hmm. really... It'll be interesting. Yeah, for I, I hope so. Maybe maybe I will find some costume or something. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you everyone, and Cheers, have a good everyone. night. Or day. Take care. Bye.